We are hearing a new concept these days in discussions about Iran, the zone of immunity. The idea, often explained by Ehud Barak, Israel's defense minister, is that soon Iran will have enough nuclear capacity that Israel would not be able to inflict a crippling blow to its program. Israeli officials explain that we Americans cannot understand their fears that Iran is an existential danger to them. But in fact, we can understand because we went through a very similar experience ourselves. After World War II, as the Soviet Union approached a nuclear capability, the United States was seized by a panic that lasted for years. Everything that Israel says about Iran now, we said then about the Soviet Union. We saw it as a radical, godless, revolutionary regime, opposed to every value we held dear, determined to overthrow the governments of the Western world in order to establish global communism. We saw Moscow as irrational, aggressive, and utterly unconcerned with human life. After all, Stalin had just sacrificed a mind-boggling 26 million Soviet lives in his country's struggle against Nazi Germany. Just as Israel is openly considering preemptive strikes against Iran, many in the West urged such strikes against Moscow in the late 1940s. The calls came not just from hawks, but even from lifelong pacifists like the public intellectual Bertrand Russell. To get a sense of the mood of the times, consider this entry from the November 29, 1948 diary of Harold Nicholson, one of the coolest and most sober British diplomats of his generation. Quote, it is probably true that Russia is preparing for the final battle for world mastery and that once she has enough bombs, she will destroy Western Europe, occupy Asia, and have a final death struggle with America. If that happens and we are wiped out over here, the survivors in New Zealand may say that we were mad not to have prevented this. There is a chance that the danger may pass and peace can be secured with peace. I admit it is a frail chance. Not one in 90. In a speech at the Boston Navy Yard in August 1950, the Secretary of the Navy, Francis Matthews, argued that the United States needed to become an initiator of war of aggression and in this sense would become the first aggressor for peace. In the end, however, the global revolutionaries in Moscow, the mad autocrats in Pyongyang, the terrorists supporting military in Pakistan, all with nukes, have been deterred by mutual fears of destruction. We call it deterrence. And remember, Israel has 250 nuclear bombs, many on submarines, to ensure that Tehran realizes it would be mutually assured destruction. And while the Iranian regime is often called crazy, it has done much less to merit that term than did a regime such as Mao's China. Over the past decade, for example, there have been thousands of suicide bombings around the world by Saudis, Egyptians, Lebanese, Palestinians, Pakistanis. But there has not been a single suicide attack by an Iranian. Is the Iranian regime really likely to launch the first? The efforts to delay and disrupt Iran's nuclear program are working. But even if one day Tehran manages to build a few crude bombs, a policy of robust containment and deterrence is better to contemplate than a preventive war.